seated. Good morning. What a wonderfully chilly day it is. The earth it seems to be caked now with snow. It is a very, very nice day for sure. How many got to throw a snowball uh, this week? Yeah, we got some snowballs. Anybody build a snow person? Did you build any snow people? An igloo? I got a couple up there. Nice, nice. So some fun, not in the sun, in the cold. <laughs> well, good morning. We have a few wonderful things that are going on in the month of January. First and foremost, Wonderful on Wednesdays. Wonderful on Wednesdays is our discipleship program for all ages. Um, they are on Wednesdays at 6.30 over at the Celebration Center. And this week, we're going to be wrapping up Session 1 and moving on to Session 2. Um, oh, so, excuse me, this week will end, uh, session one will end this week, and then the following week we'll begin into session two. And there are some wonderful classes to join in session two. I would like to highlight one of them. It's called A Place to Start, and it is taught by Pastor Candace and I, and it's a great opportunity for you to learn more about First Church and um, our core beliefs, as well as so much more. Plus, if you join along, you get a free t-shirt. So you got to go to all three sessions, you get a t-shirt, and uh, it's a great time. There are wildflyers out in the lobby. It's literally to our right, um, as well as a sign-up board. Feel free to sign up for any of the classes. Those wildflyers will give you all the rest of the classes going on in session two. And we invite all people of all ages to come and join us for our WOW programming. Starting on January 18th, Men Under Construction starts a new Bible study, The Seven Challenges Men Encounter. Excuse me. The men's group meets on Tuesdays at 6.30 over in the Celebration Center uh, at the Gathering Place. Family Ministry invites all families with students uh, K through college to our Thrive Family Meal event on January 23rd at 4.30. Okay? So we'll have a time of worship, some great food, and then we're going to talk about all the various things that, are the, that Student Ministries does, um, Promised Land, Impacts, our college ministry, C3. Um, so we'll give a heads up and kind of outline what's going to be transpiring for the next three to four months. It'll be a great time, and all families, once again, are invited K through college. This week, the Tree of Hope is lit in memory of Dorothy L. Upton, in memory of Richard Byrd, in memory of Larry and Esther Postma, and in celebration of the future and hope we have in Jesus Christ. The mission candle this morning is lit to the glory of God. And now we turn to our memory verse for the month of January. It is from Proverbs 16.3. Um, me and the choir will say it first, and then we'll say it together as one church family. And it goes like this. Commit to to the Lord Lord, whatever you do, and God God will establish your plans. plans. All right, together now as one church family. Commit to the Lord whatever you do, and God will establish your plans. Amen.
God of power and might, we are in awe of your creation. You have caked the earth with snow, it feels like. It is chilly. And so we see and we feel the changes of the season. We love that we get to explore your creation, that we get to play and have fun, to throw snowballs and build snow people. And we are just reminded of what a wonderful place it is that we live in. And we give you thanks for that, God. We are also reminded, Lord, of all the changes that happen and transpire in our lives. And yet we remember that you and your love are unchanging. That every day your love for us is the same today, yesterday, and tomorrow. That your hope in us, your joy in us, your patience with us. And so God, we give you thanks that you love us unceasingly, that your grace is open and available to us, and we chase after it. So, Lord, we ask this morning that you would fill up our cups, fill us with your love and divine presence. Let us feel your grace and mercy in our lives guide us and direct us in the, in the path that you would have us to take. And ultimately, God, mold us to conform and look more like your son, Jesus Christ. That not only do we receive this love and grace from you, Lord, but we go out to give it to others. And Lord, there are many, and perhaps our families, and in our community for sure that are sick or hurting or in despair, sad. And so, God, we pray that you would enter into those situations, but not only you, God, but that you would empower us to go as well, to be your hands and feet, to be, take care of those who are sick, to give comforting words to those who are lonely or perhaps in sadness. Inspire us through the power of your Holy Spirit to be your people in this world. People who are filled up and overflowing with your love. We pray these same things for Camp Branch Baptist. That they too would be mighty vessels for your love and grace. That they would go to proclaim the name of Jesus Christ in mighty and powerful ways, in word and in deed. We give you thanks for their witness and all that they do to further and proclaim the good news of Jesus Christ. We pray for Whittier uh, High School. Lord, be with those students. Keep them safe and secure, but continue to challenge and have them stretch and grow into the fullness of who they are to be in you. We pray for all the administrators and the teachers and the staff. God, give them the wisdom to make timely decisions on the things that need to be done and taken care of in their respective areas. But let them also feel the love, your love, a love that never changes, as well as the love from the community to say we appreciate you, and we do. God, you have called us to such wonderful things in this world. But sometimes these burdens are heavy or the direction seems cloudy and foggy. And so, God, as we talk about committing our lives to you, we ask that you would guide us and strengthen us every day of our life. And now we pray as Jesus taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, 
temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. We give out of the love that we have for God and for one another. Your generous giving enables us to do such amazing ministry here, in, uh, here at First Church and beyond. Uh, there are three ways to give. We have our joy boxes located at the entrances. You can drop off your gifts there. Um, for online and in person, we have our electronic giving, secure give, a safe, easy online method to be able to give, as well as uh, you can always mail in or drop off your gifts over at the Celebration Center. If you are a visitor, please don't feel obligated to give. You are our guests. And children, uh, you can join Macy in the back if you'd like to go to Children's Church.
First Church. It is great to be with you today. Uh, before I forget, I have just a housekeeping note. I went through the Christmas mailbox at Celebration Center and brought some cards to Thompson site today that belong to some of you. So check the box out there. There's still some Christmas cards in those boxes, and we'll be putting that up in the next week or so. We don't want you to miss any of your Christmas greetings. Anything that's left there that has gift cards will go directly toward the pastoral fund. <laughs> Just teasing. Um, also, I want to invite you on the 17th of each month to be in prayer for Easter at the Mathewson. Easter is this year on April 17, and we're going to go back to the Mathewson this year. And so we invite you uh, to pray. Tomorrow is the 17th. Pray on the 17th of each month. Um, pray for anything that comes to mind about the Mathewson. Anytime you see the number 17 anywhere, we would just encourage you to lift the Matthewson in prayer. If it's just as simply as saying, Lord, work through the Matthewson, we would appreciate that as we go forward and prayerfully cover at Easter Sunday. Well, we are in our second week of our hashtag committed series as we look with our, as we've said, the Bible verse together today coming from Proverbs 16, 3, to commit our, to the Lord whatever we do and that God will establish our plans. And so when it comes to the first of the year, we typically think of New Year's resolutions, turning over a new page, starting a year out fresh, coming with brand new ideas. And so people set New Year's resolutions and typically what's the number one resolution? Lose weight, you're right. So I took, a, I took a, a survey of the top 10 resolutions for 2022, and here they are. Number one, lose weight. Number two, eat healthier or change your diet. Three, get fitter, because like, you're already fit, I guess. Get fitter and take in more exercise. Um, four, spend more time with family and friends. Five, be more aware and take care of your mental health. And six, we go to cut back on spending. Seven, travel more. Anybody want to travel more this year? Yes. Eight, take up a new hobby, a sport, or any other interest. Nine, be more environmentally friendly. And number 10, ready for this? Look for a new job. <laughs> now, you don't have to raise your hand in case your employer is in this room, but if you're one of the 10, best of luck to each of you. Well, we have these focus. It's lose or find, stop, start, more, less, reduce, or gain. And keeping in within that tradition, we're going to kick off this series with talking about increasing and decreasing. Uh, but let's go to prayer before we go any further. Lord God of abundance, we come to you with our hearts today asking for you to speak to them, to move within them, Lord, teach us your ways, and Lord, would you speak through me? In your powerful name we pray, amen. A few months ago, we talked about John the Baptist, and John the Baptist is a relative of Jesus. We're not really sure how they are related. Typically, we call them cousins, but we don't really know how they're related. John the Baptist and Jesus, their ministries overlapped. Uh, they were about six months apart in age, and John the Baptist was a fulfillment of the prophecy from Isaiah 40. And we read that verse, and it's saying that someone is going to come and make a way for the Lord in the wilderness, preparing the way for the Lord. And that was John the Baptist who did that. Now, the Gospels make a point of telling us all about John the Baptist, in fact, even what he wore, which tells us that maybe not everybody acted and dressed like John the Baptist, said he wore camel hair clothing, a leather belt, and he ate um, locusts and wild honey. And so John the Baptist was an integral part of Jesus' ministry in telling people about the coming Messiah, calling them to repent of their sins. And every one of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, tell of Jesus' baptism, which was done by John the Baptist. And at Jesus' baptism, we see the Trinity. We hear God's voice say, This is my Son in whom I'm well pleased. We see the Holy Spirit descending like a dove, and Jesus is there being baptized. 
So when we are talking about John the Baptist, we re recognize also he was a rabbi. He was a teacher. He had followers, students whom we call disciples. And so when we're going to read this passage from John 3, we're hearing this conversation between John the Baptist and his disciples. But because we're all good students of Scripture, the very first verse we're going to look at comes from verse chapter 20, or verse 22 in chapter 3. And the thing it says is, after this. So good students would say, after what? Well, the passage that precedes this is the conversation between Jesus and Nicodemus, where we have that famous verse of, for God so loved the world that God gave his only son. And so this is after that conversation. And so we read, it says, After this, Jesus and his disciples went out to the Judean countryside where he spent some time, and they baptized. Now, John was also baptizing people near Salem because there was plenty of water, and people were coming to be baptized, and this was before John was put in prison. Now, an argument developed between some of John's disciples and a certain Jew over the matter of ceremonial washing. And they came to John and said to him, Rabbi, that man who was with you on the other side of the Jordan, and they're talking about Jesus, the one you tes testified about, look, he's baptizing and everyone is going to him. Now to this, John replied, a person can only receive what is given them from heaven. And you yourselves can testify that I said, I am not the Messiah. I'm not the Messiah, but I'm sent ahead of him. The bride belongs to the bridegroom. The friend who attends the bridegroom waits and listens for him and is full of joy when he hears the bridegroom's voice. Now all through scripture, we see that the church is compared to the bride. And Jesus is considered the groom. And John is saying, hey, I am just taking care of the groom. I'm like the best man. I'm getting things ready, but I am not the groom. The church is the bride. And he says, I am full of joy to prepare this place. He says, that joy is mine and is now complete. He said, he, meaning Jesus, must become greater and I must become less. Now, John's words pointing to the Messiah there is saying, you know what, it's not about me. And now that Christ has come, I can get out of the way. But you know what, it's not like our culture today to say, hey, don't look at me, don't put any attention on me. We have a culture that's like, hey, look at me, give me some attention. And we know this when we get on social media or television, Social media, you get on Facebook, you have Reels, you have Instagram, Snapchat stories, you have all of it, TikTok, you have these people telling you things, and I have to admit, I get sucked into it too. But before I know it, I have watched like 10 six-second videos of people telling me what they ate for dinner, and I don't even know these people, and I'm thinking I'm never going to get this time back, that people are like, look at me. John the Baptist is saying, don't look at me. Look at Jesus. Jesus must increase and I must decrease. So how can that look like in our lives? How can we apply that knowledge, that wisdom that John the Baptist had, how can we apply that to our lives today? Now you all know me, I'm a storyteller. I usually just talk and we just go through stories together, but today... I have a five-point sermon. I know, it's kind of a little surprising. We're going to walk through five things that will help us in this new year increase in Christ and decrease in ourselves. So point number one. First and foremost, in order for Christ to become greater and for us to become less, less we must have an understanding of who Christ is. The Bible has hundreds of names for Jesus, and here are a few. Emmanuel, Christ, Lord, Master, the Word, Son of God, Son of Man, Lamb of God, the Light of the World. And we can say all of those names, but that does not mean that we know Jesus. 
It's kind of like saying the Queen of England. We say her name, but that doesn't mean we know her. And one of the names for Jesus is Lord. In fact, 3,322 3, times in Scripture, Jesus is called Lord. Lord, meaning I give you the authority, I ask for your direction, I want your input, I want you to govern my life. And for Jesus to be our Lord, we have to give Jesus that authority in our lives. We must recognize that Jesus is greater than us. Romans 10.9 says that if you confess with your mouth that Jesus is the Lord and you believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead, you shall be saved. So the question is, do you call Jesus your Lord? And would you read this with me this morning? Christ must increase. I must decrease. Point number two. In order for Christ to become greater and for us to become less, our lives must look like Christ. In Ephesians 4.32, we read, Be kind and compassionate to one another. What should we do? Forgiving each other, just as in Christ God forgave you. What would our lives look like if we were to forgive others as we are forgiven? What thoughts would we stop perseverating upon at night? What thoughts in the daytime would we lay aside and stop having ulcers over because we cannot forgive someone else? We have been forgiven greatly. And Jesus isn't asking us to do anything that Jesus hasn't done himself. And Jesus forgives. Would you read this with me? Christ must increase. I must decrease. Point three, in order for Christ to become greater and for us to become less, we need to be loved. We need to love as Christ loved us. In John 5, 12, it says, Jesus said, my command is this, what is it? Love each other as I have loved you. And Jesus is love. And we see Jesus' actions of love. And if we are going to be like Jesus, we must do what love does. Now, we had this little exercise last year, or last fall, and we tried this out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. I'm going to invite you all to do it again today. There's a blank, and I want you to fill in your name, and we're going to read part of the love chapter out of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. So where the blank is, you say your name. Ready? Candace is patient. Candace is kind. Candace does not envy. Candace does not boast. Candace does not get proud. Candace is not rude. Candace is not self seeking. Candace is not easily angered. Candace keeps no record of wrongs. Candace does not delight in evil, but rejoices with the truth. Candace always protects. Candace always trusts. Candace always hopes. Candace always perseveres in love. Now, we know this one. This is just a reminder to us, a refresher course in January of how we are to love. We are to love everyone. We are to love the ones that we like. We are to love the ones we don't like. We are to love the ones that cut us off in traffic. We are to love the ones who drive so slowly in front of us that we could take a nap. That one might be especially close to my heart. We must love the ones who infuriate us. We must love the ones who irritate us. We must love the ones who have hurt us. And we must love us. Christ says love all, and that's ourselves as well. But oftentimes it's hard to love ourselves. In order to make Christ greater and ourselves less, we must live a life of love. Would you read this with me? Christ must increase. I must decrease. Becoming like Christ is not simply head knowledge. 
It's an act of the Spirit. It's asking Christ to come into our lives and shape us, to create within us a a new heart, to mold our heart to look like God's. It's an invitation. It's a receiving the invitation of love and grace that's been extended to us long before we know it. If we could simply just do these things, we would do them. But we have to invite Christ to do them within us. Now, the next part of this is action on our part. There are some things that we must do to decrease in ourselves and allow Christ to increase within us. Part four, in order for Christ to become greater and for us to become less, we must know what Christ calls us to do. And we find these instructions in Scripture And these following verses show us what will happen within our hearts as we focus on God's word. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and the attitudes of our hearts. In 1 Peter we read that, We have been born again, not of a perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and enduring word of God. For all men are like grass, and all their glory is like the flowers of the field. The grass withers, the flowers fall, but the word of the Lord stands forever. And in Colossians we read that the let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach and admonish one another in wisdom, and as you sing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with gratitude, in your hearts to God. As we focus on Christ's word, the scriptures, we have joy where we once had it, did not have it before. And in order for Christ to become greater in our lives, we may have to decrease in some things. We may have to decrease in our social media time, decrease in our television time, decrease in Netflix, decrease in gaming. Decrease in reading, Greek decrease in working, because we only have so much time. And we have to give up something in order to increase in another area. And sometimes we just need to lay aside doing nothing so that we can increase our time with Christ. In the book of Colossians, Paul says, set your mind on things above and not on earthly things. It reminds me of this account we read in Acts 19. It's on the third missionary journey of Paul. Paul was an apostle of Jesus and went forward to tell about Christ. It's where the world started knowing about Jesus through the efforts of Paul and companions. In verse 11, we read that God did extraordinary miracles through Paul. Even the aprons and handkerchiefs that Paul had touched carried so much power that they could be given to the people who were sick and filled with an evil spirit, and they would be healed. Now, some Jews went around driving out these evil spirits to invoke the name of the Lord Jesus over those who were demon-possessed. And so what they were doing is there were some Jews that were like, hey, Paul's just saying these words and casting out spirits. I'm going to try this too. So these Jews started saying, I'm going to cast you out in the name of Paul, who is the follower of Jesus Christ. But it wasn't working until one day, listen to what happened. One day an evil spirit answered them and said, Jesus I know and Paul I know, but who are you? And the man who had had an evil spirit jumped on them and overpowered these um, Jews, and he gave them such a beating that they ran out of the house naked and bleeding. This this evil spirit was like, "Mm -mm, don't know who you are. And so when the hiss became known by the Jews and Greeks living in Ephesus, they were seized with fear, and the name of the Lord Jesus Christ was held in high honor. And many of those who had believed now came out and openly confessed what had been done. And listen to what happened next. A number who had been practiced sorcery brought their scrolls together and burned them publicly. And when they calculated the value of the scrolls, the total came to 50,000 drachmas. And in this way, the word of the Lord spread widely and grew in power. Now, a drachma today would be equal to about one hour of minimum wage. 
So 50,000 drachmas times like 11.15 takes us to $575,500 in educational materials. And what these Jews were saying was, I no longer am going to put my trust in the sorcery materials I've been following. I'm going to decrease my attention on something that is not true, that doesn't benefit me, and increase my attention on Jesus Christ. The opportunities became greater for them to learn because they set aside something that was giving them distraction from the power of Jesus Christ. And you know, too often the parts within us that were created to serve and adore Christ are entangled by the busyness in our lives, by the apathy in our lives. And we are not able to do all that Christ is calling us to do. Number five, and the last one, Christ is to become greater, and for me to become less, we need to live a life of prayer. In Luke 6, 12, we read that Jesus went off to a mountain to pray, and he spent the whole night in prayer. Notice it didn't say Jesus spent the whole night worrying, and then he thought about praying a little bit, because that's what our nights look like oftentimes, don't they? But Jesus lived this example of prayer. He taught others about prayer. He prayed regularly and often. We read this in Scripture. He even prayed while he was dying. He decreased in himself so that the increase would come to the mission of God. Christ must become greater and I must become less. Now, I've been reading a lot lately and I wish I could give this um, quotation credit to someone that I'm going to paraphrase here, but I re went back through what I had listened to and read this week, and I could not find it again. But I thought this quotation was pretty powerful. It says, We are never too small to be used by God, but we might consider ourselves too great, which limits how God can use us. In 2022, may we decrease and Christ increase. May we be committed to all that God would call us to do. And would you read this with me one more time? Christ must increase. I must decrease. Would you pray with me? Lord God, we are thankful that you call our hearts to follow you. That when we lay aside the things that preoccupy us, Lord, we are always gaining more of you. Your blessings, your gifts, your talents, your riches, Lord. Your riches of love, your riches of kindness and joy, faithfulness, peace. Lord, help us to decrease in all the things that we call earthly wealth an increase in your heavenly riches of love, grace, and mercy. Lord, stir within us hearts that desire to follow you and all you are calling us to. Lord, help us individually and as a faith community, Lord, decrease so that Christ, you, may increase in all we do. Your powerful name of Jesus Christ, we pray. Amen. We invite you to uh, this time of prayer as we stand and sing this song together. If you have a prayer concern, you may come forward. We'd be honored to pray with you this morning.
faith for the world. I believe the Lord will bless us and keep us. I believe the Lord will make his face shine upon us and will be gracious to us. I believe the Lord is with us in our going out and in our coming in, in our laying down and in our rising up, in our labor and in our leisure, in our laughter and in our tears, until we come to stand before Jesus in that day when there is no sunset and no dawning. Amen. Yeah.